Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of the ASF Scots in Us podcast. This week our episode is around the Scots who built New York, the modernists, a project that the American Scottish Foundation has been involved in for many years now as we've been developing this incredible story of how the influence of Scotland was so great upon the building of New York. And now I'm joined by John Kinnear, a historian and architect, who has been leading on the project. John, good morning. Well, good morning, Camilla. Yes, it's been quite a project and uh, we got started in it a number of years ago with the Landmarks Alliance, which was a group that was put together um, to celebrate the Landmarks Commission's 50th anniversary. And they asked all our all the different groups if there was something they could do to contribute to the to the history of the preservation of New York. And we had no idea when we began this project how what a large subject it was going to be. I mean, I think we began by looking at uh, McKim, didn't we? We did. We knew Charles McKim of McKim Mead and White was of Scottish descent, and we did our first our first talk on his work, which was incredible and extraordinary as it was. And then started researching uh, more Scots that had something to do with New York. And before we knew it, we were all the way back to the beginnings of New Amsterdam, which had many Scots involved in the building of the city. I think over the period of three, we divided it into 100 year pods almost. Didn't Pretty we? much, yeah. And we really, at this point, have over 90 uh, buildings uh, that have have a connection to Scotland through architects or builders or nowadays engineers. Mm -hmm. And that really is why we come to the, the modernists because it really is a fascinating um, progression of everything. So John, could you take us forward and begin our talk <laughs> on the Scots who built New York, the modernists? Modernists is, uh, is the uh, influence of the Scots in the beginning of the 20th century to today. And in this talk, we'll be, we'll be uh, reviewing buildings and architects and developers and, and people like Andrew Carnegie, of course, who was very instrumental in the development of the city during this period. And we'll see what they did. It's, it's quite extraordinary. So onward we go. Thank you. Enjoy. Hello, this is John Kinnear, and I'm here with the, uh, the American Scottish Foundation, and we're going to talk about the modernists. This is part of a series that we've been doing over the last few years that tells about the Scots who has actually built New York City. Uh, this will start us at the beginning of the 20th century. Walter Cook, the Scottish architect who was responsible for the, uh, for the Frederick Pack. Pratt House, which is at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. This house was a transitional design, uh, taking elements from the Georgian style and incorporating them into some of the new ideas that were happening at the beginning of the century. Cook was also the architect for, for Andrew Carnegie. These are some early sketches of the Carnegie Mansion, which is now the Cooper Hewitt Museum here in Manhattan on 90th Street and Fifth Avenue. The Carnegie Mansion today has been converted to the Cooper Hewitt Museum, which is an incredibly good uh, example of a building making its way into the 21st century. The building at the time was extremely modern. It had conveniences that no other residents or building had at the time period. There were electric stoves, massive kitchens, and air conditioning. It was just state of the art, an electric elevator, picture of the museum today, uh, again, as the, as the museum, it's extremely successful. Uh, if you haven't visited, you should. It's got cutting edge technology, uh, which allows you to click on to any exhibit you're looking at and information about that will be sent back to your, uh, your uh, internet, to your connections. Carnegie also was responsible for building libraries all over the English speaking world. New York City alone has 67 of these libraries. All of them, except for I think two, are still active libraries or community centers today. 
he hired the best architects, many of them was of Scottish descent, to do these buildings. John Duncan, another Scottish architect, who was very, very prominent at the turn of the century, responsible for Grant's tomb, the most extraordinary building. If you haven't been there, you really have to make your way there. <clears throat> it's probably one of the best examples anywhere of taking traditional construction uh, concepts, uh, arches, and domes, and blending them together in the most extraordinary interiors. Here's the building not too long after it was built, again, about the turn of the century. This is just a, the beginning of the interiors. It's, it's just breathtaking. You won't find better architecture like this anywhere in the world. It takes elements from all the classic styles and blends them together. Again, uh, the, uh, the tomb about the time it was open, more of these incredible interiors. Again, just uh, absolute magic, the way he's combined all these elements in the decor. Another shot of the exterior with our massive Navy <laughs> anchored in the Hudson River. John Duncan also did the Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn beautiful arch. Uh, another, if you haven't seen it, you should. Uh, the proportions and scale, I think, are the best arch probably in the city. Uh, and, and the massive sculptures, just a beautiful composition. He also did townhouses. The Lehman townhouse is rather extraordinary. It looks like a lot of French influence in this building. William Tuttle, another architect of, of Scottish descent. He's the architect for Carnegie Hall. Again, an Andrew Carnegie project. Andrew Carnegie came up with this as he returned to New York after his honeymoon, having met some of the famous composers of, uh, in Europe. <clears throat> they all told him that what was missing in New York was a grand hall where music could be properly performed. William Tuttle, a uh, Scottish architect, was chosen even though he'd never done anything like this before. He, but he was a, a pretty well-known cellist and his understanding of music and his also uh, touring Europe to see some of the grand opera houses there <clears throat> gave him the inspiration he needed to create Carnegie Hall, which to this day is one of the most acoustically perfect buildings. This building was one of the last large buildings to be done with masonry supporting walls. It was the first, one of the first combinations of steel from Carnegie Mills, of course, uh, to be used in such a way. This picture represents the latest renovations of the building where the rooftop was turned into a beautiful garden space, which uh, is, is the site of many summer activities and events. We also did the house, the building on Fifth Avenue and 33rd Street. This building started life as a carriage uh, retailer for horse-drawn carriages and then was converted, of course, to automobiles. The building now is in a fight to become a landmark in the city. Again, the extraordinary use of large plate glass windows and arches uh, as represents his style. Also did the Yacht Club for the Columbia University, which has been restored and is still up on the Hudson River. Frank Lloyd Wright. Wright, of course, the name, the name was used in from earliest times to represent a, a tradesman or a specialist like a wheelwright, a shipwright, barrelwright, and that's the, the origin of the name itself. Uh, the rights were in the border, the borderlands between uh, Scotland and England, the coat of arms and his tartan. Frank Lloyd Wright was, was a pioneer in really coming up with a new approach to architecture. Uh, imagine these houses were being built at the same time as the shingle style and late Victorian houses, Queen Anne, etc. cetera. So it was a bold transition. And a lot of these houses were built uh, in the outskirts of Chicago where he, where he originally worked as an architect. Again, the little house, which you can visit this interior, it's at the museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Again, showing this incredible transition from what was being what the normal houses looked like at this time period. Falling Water, the most iconic house could be in the world, was built by him in 1939. Totally a new direction. 
defying gravity in a lot of ways, obviously with these incredible decks and built into the stone of the, of the site. And of course, the feature of the site is this waterfall and Frank Lloyd Wright, instead of putting the house where you're constantly looking at the waterfall, he made the waterfall a experience. You can hear it from anywhere in the house, but if you want to see it, you have to take a path about an eighth of a mile walk to get to the spot where this photograph was taken. Frank Lloyd Wright spent much of his time in his later life here in New York City. Uh, and this is a book that tells you all about that era for him. Of course, the uh, Guggenheim Museum was the primary reason he was here in town. He lived in the Plaza Hotel and redesigned one of the suites, giving, uh, giving the room a lot of his, his kind of features. This is one of his few houses in New York City. It's a Crimson Beach House in Staten Island. It's still there, it's still privately owned, the interiors of the house. He did a wonderful car showroom on Park Avenue, which was in existence till about five years ago when it was finally demolished. It never became an interior landmark, which is too bad. Um, it's here's one of his early experiments with using ramps. It's the plan, pure Frank Lloyd Wright. <laughs> Some of the cars. Cars were smaller then and they fit very well on his ramps. This is the house that Frank Lloyd Wright designed for Marilyn Monroe and Arthur Miller up in Roxbury, Connecticut. Um, he really loved working with Marilyn. He wouldn't let Arthur attend any of the meetings. Came up with this extraordinary house, but of course the budget was huge and Arthur Miller balked at that. The same plan essentially has been used in Hawaii for uh, the clubhouse for a golf course. One that was fortunately never built Frank Lloyd Wright designed these towers around St. Mark's Church, which was also done by a Scottish architect here in New York, and um, <clears throat> fortunately still exists in its park setting, so none of these buildings ever came to fruition. These are some of the plans. Uh, again, he came up with a new concept even for high-rise buildings, somewhat like a tree, and then all the rooms uh, were like branches off of the tree. It's just very lucky it was never built. Here's an early model of the Guggenheim Museum. If you look at the model and we'll see later the building that actually evolved, which actually came out to be a much, much nicer than this original concept. Early sketches a little closer to what was built. And here it is, an extraordinary building. Opening day, massive crowds, of course. The interior. To this day, a magnificent space. Frank Lloyd Wright was one of the first architects to collaborate with some of the major um, fashion industry and decorating industries here in, in the United States. Here's a line of fabrics, it was Schumacher. Furniture, of course, more fabrics. And some early designs, again, never, never, uh, never executed more in the Bauhaus era kind of style. And of course, the incredible mile high skyscraper, which never happened, but it was an extraordinary exercise. Frank Lloyd Wright had a number of shows, one man shows, of course, at the Modern. And this represents uh, one of them in 1940. Here's another show uh, in 2014, relating uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's ideas for cities, which was very different cities that we have. <clears throat> His concept was everybody needed a little bit of an airspace, their own green, green space around their home. Stamped for Frank Lloyd Wright in 1966. Another fellow, a Scott, who is extremely influential here in the United States, although he never visited the United States, um, primarily was in Scotland and, in, and later became more of a painter than an architect and went to England. The Glasgow School of Art is premier building, which unfortunately has suffered through two fires in the last 10 or 15 years. And <clears throat> massive fundraising has made it possible to have the building restored. Some of his early drawings. His style, as we will see, shares a lot of the same, the same uh, concepts that Frank Lloyd Wright was developing here in the United States. Although the two never met, they actually never there was no real publications of either's work 
where they could have seen what each other were doing. It's just like the, somewhat from the same gene pool, these two people. There's the interiors of the uh, Glasgow School. One of his other buildings was the Glasgow Herald Building, which is now known as the Lighthouse. Another one of his schools. The Willow Tea Rooms. Uh, the Willow Tea Rooms were one of his uh, repeat clients. And we can see here that he designed, did everything. Did the interiors, designed all the furniture, all the windows. And here you can see a little bit of that crossover with the Frank Lloyd Wright style of furniture. Big pictures, of course, were part of his design. The Hill House, probably his best residence, uh, is under, under uh, restoration right now. They built an entire a huge roof structure over the entire building so that they can restore all the plaster work on the outside. Here's some of his furniture, again, very unique, completely uh, original for the time period. And again, harks back a little bit to Frank Lloyd Wright's designs. The washstand, the incorporation of glass and wood was one of his features. Here's the building known as, there's the top of that building known as the lighthouse now. Uh, Rene had, Charles Rene had two shows in the United States, uh, which was, responsible for some of his influencing other architects here in this country. The first one here is in 2012. He became well known in Scotland, of course, and had a hundred pound note in his honor. Next architect, John Russell Pope, his coat of arms, probably best known for his work on the Frick Museum. Uh, after the Frick, Mr. Frick passed away, the building was converted into a museum, which we all know today and, and it's still an extraordinary, one of the best museums in New York City, without a doubt. Here's a concept drawing for the, uh, for the wonderful garden court. This is another example of the, the completed project uh, surpassing the early concepts. It's a garden court today, another shot of the garden. The wonderful oval gallery, which is uh, where it's the premier gallery whenever they have special shows. John Russell Pope also did the Scottish Rite in Washington, D.C., which again is a, a very interesting, unique building, relying a lot on classical influence from both Greece, Rome, and Egypt. In details of the statue work. William Lamb, his father was a carpenter in Edinburgh. William, born in the United States, became a very well-known architect. Mo, you know, most well known, of course, for the Empire State Building. Extraordinary. Some of the shots of the construction workers in the pre OSHA days. OSHA, of course, now would never allow anything like this to happen. Of course, they were able to do this entire building in 13 months. Most incredible. And in the background, you can see the Chrysler Building. Now, Chrysler was built, of course, by the head of the Chrysler Corporation. The Empire State Building was built by the head of the uh, General Motors automobile business just after he retired. We've all seen these movies, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, John Raskob and Pierre Dupont. The, you know, Dupont's were from the Dupont family, of course. And Raskob was General Motors. William Lamb also did 40 Wall Street, which is uh, today still existing. And for a very short period of time, less than a year, it was the tallest building in the world. It was, it was, uh, to come by the Chrysler building. The, the Chrysler building construction people waited until 40 Wall Street was totally complete and then raised a spire, which we all know today, which was built inside the building and raised and the spire made it the largest, the tallest building in the world following 40 Wall Street. They had this title for, again, about a year. And then of course the Empire State Building came along and held the title till, oh gosh, I think into the 1960s. William Lamb also did the Forbes Magazine building, which is on uh, Fifth Avenue at about 13th or 14th Street, now part of NYU. But you can see some of the beginning style here, uh, you know, the verticality of it, which, which uh, you'll see, of course, in the Empire State Building. Also did the Standard Oil Building, which is on uh, 43rd Street and Fifth Avenue. I worked in this building way up near the top in my early days of my career. At that time, you could still see out to the Hudson River when, they, when the ocean liners would be coming into port, mostly on Fridays. Philip Johnson, again, from the borderlands of Scotland and England. 
Philip Johnson's very well known, of course, for his uh, collaboration with Mies van der Rohe with the Seagram's building, which Phyllis Brockman of the Brockman family, which owns Seagram's. He also wrote this book, uh, which had a lot to do with establishing the international style as a style, the Seagram building. To this day, probably one of the best examples of a glass skyscraper. It's actually bronze and glass on the outside. Here's a Four Seasons restaurant, which uh, is, a, is a landmarked interior. There are very few landmarked interiors in the entire city, probably less than 100. And to this day, it still looks this way, fortunately. It's no longer the Four Seasons restaurant, but at least the, the space exists. Philip Johnson all did the sculpture garden at MoMA, which again, is still there today even though the museum has expanded probably three times the size it was at this, at this time. So did the New York State Theater at Lincoln Center. And Alan Ritchie. Alan Ritchie joined Philip Johnson, who was his last partner. Philip Johnson went through a series of different partners. And he's of Scottish descent. This is his coat of arms and the part of the culture where he came from. Uh, they collaborated on the... Uh, on many projects, and there's a book that you can get about these projects. Worked together on the what was originally the AT&T building, now the Sony building, uh, with its classic split pediment, harking back to Georgian style. Lipstick building on Third Avenue. Elliptical building, fairly well known. And the Trump International Hotel. At, at Columbus Circle, which was an existing building that they redid. But Christ the building, there's a, the, the, uh, these, these spires, these points sort of park to the towers at the top of the Christ the building. Some of the buildings along the West Side Highway where the rail yard used to be, clock at Lincoln Center. Benjamin Thompson, Scottish descent. He was responsible for the South Street Seaport uh, which uh, has been a, a great tourist attraction and, and combination of restored very early New York buildings and new buildings on the piers. This was his original building, the drawings, and it did look like this. It since, since in the last few years has been dismantled and a new building takes its place. Benjamin Thompson was also responsible for Baltimore's uh, re redevelopment of its harbor and a number of similar projects around the country. Here they re he did this restoration of Vernal Hall in Boston. He also was the founder of the design research retail operation. Vernal Hall is still a very, very popular destination when you visit Boston. Charles Renfro, Scottish descent with Dillers, Caffindo and Renfro. The bistro at the Seagram's building, this is uh, Still a very popular place to meet for lunch or dinner. Alice Telly Hall. This building was done in 2003. <clears throat> the firm also did the master plan for the redevelopment of Lincoln Center, which is still ongoing. Another shot of the building. High Line, one of New York's most popular attractions today. They were the architects that helped put the architectural part of this project together. Of course, it's also an incredible park garden situation today and responsible to changing an entire west side neighborhood uh, very extraordinary successful project some views of the garden of the high line the project of course was the result of two fellows uh, attending a city meeting when they were talking about taking down this this section of the old old railroad they initiated the project and, and got enough people involved to turn it around and, and it was their, their simple concept, but it actually turned into something that actually happened here in New York. Just beautiful from any angle, <laughs> it's terrific. And of course it spurred so much development up and down the High Line, new hotels, office buildings, restaurants, apartment houses, everything. There are, there are uh, many cities around the world have copied this, this same concept with old railroads Paris included. The same company was involved and in designed the shed that's in the Hudson Yards now, which is a terrific venue. Uh, hopefully we'll all be able to experience some more now that the world's coming slightly back to normal. 
Okay, their company also is involved with the master planning for all the expansion that's happening and has been happening at MoMA, uh, an incredibly huge project. And this is, uh, this completes our talk about the modernists and brings us up to the Scottish influence on New York City today. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today to hear about the Scots who built New York, the modernists. It was wonderful to hear from John Kinnear and learn of the progress made with Andrew Carnegie Steel becoming a part of our lives and buildings then being able to go to great heights. This was the eighth talk we had in our series, The Scots Who Built New York. Nearly 100 buildings have been identified by us as we have been undertaking this project the last few years. And as a result, two maps are now available. The first one, is the Scots who built New York walking tours of Lower Manhattan, Midtown East, and Midtown West. And the second one is the Andrew Carnegie walking tour, which we developed in conjunction with the Carnegie Corporation, which takes you around the buildings that he had such an impact upon. And so until next time, thank you for joining us. No, I'm not a passenger, I'm part